Yes, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're logging from. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this second session of the Glossal and Soy Spectroscopy webinar. My name is Isabel Verbeck from the Global Soy Partnership Secretariat. Our today webinar will introduce you to a very important topic, soil spectroscopy for accurate measurement of soil physical and chemical soil properties. Before starting, I would like to remind you that the session is organized in a webinar format in which participants cannot activate their audio and camera. The meeting is recorded and the recording and presentation will be uploaded on the Glossolan webpage. Excuse us for the delay of um, uploading the recording from last week, but we were very busy at the Global Soil Partnership with our annual plenary uh, assembly, but we will do this within the end of this, this week, this um, today webinar and the one from last week. So uh, some technical uh, information, you are encouraged to post your question in the Q&A box, which will be moderated by my Glossal and colleagues. In addition, you can see also a chat box available that can be used for interacting between participants. And please use the chat uh, responsibly. For any technical issues, you can write to me directly on the chat. I will be very happy to help. Um, finally, I would like to invite you to join our new Facebook group, the so Glossal and Soy Spectroscopy for my colleague here. We'll put the link now on the chat. So before digging into soil spectroscopy with our renowned speaker, I would like to give the floor to my colleague Yi Peng, who will uh, provide you with a bit of background on the Global Soil Partnership and Glossolan, and he will be moderating this session. Yi, over to you. Thank you, Lucrez, uh, Isabel. Uh, good morning, good uh, afternoon, good uh, evening. Depending, depending on where you're logging. Uh, in the next few minutes, I will just briefly introduce a little bit uh, uh, to let us know, give some brief information who is organizing this webinar and why we are organizing this webinar. Uh, this webinar is organized under the framework of the Global Soil Partnership, we call GSP. GSP is established in 2002 to position soils in a global agenda through collective actions. Our, our main objective is to promote sustainable soil management and improve soil governance to guarantee health and productive soils. And all the activities are downscaled through the all seven regional soil partnership, also supported with all partners and our international governmental technical panel on soils. This ITPS is the highest body of our expert panels. Re regarding the working area, we are working with a, a range of to a wide range of topics, as you can see from the screen. On behalf of the, all these topics, we also have a different technical networks. For example, Glossalon, and uh, for example, the international network of the Black Soil. For more information, you can find it in our website. Talking about the Glossalon, Glossalon is a global soil laboratory network. It's established in 2017 to build and strengthen the capacity of a laboratory in soil analysis and to respond to the need for harmonizing soil analytical data. In 2017, we started to work on the wet chemistry, focus on the training harmonization and the SOP standard operating procedures and the execution of the inter-laboratory comparisons. In last year, we launched the Global uh, Glossalon Initiative on Soil Spectroscopy. We also call dry chemistry. The main objective of this uh, initiative is focus on the national capacity training. So that is why we, also, we, organ we organized this, uh, the first series of the webinar to invite all the scientists, well-known scientists, to share their knowledge to the world and uh, let our colleagues and labs research groups around the world to know and to learn this technique. Last year, we also launched the International Network on Fertilizer Analysis. For more information, you are very welcome to visit our website. Also write an email to me, write email to my colleague, Lucrezia. 
In the end, I would like to introduce our coming webinars as some, some of you already joined the last webinar and second webinar and the third webinar will also focus on the general information on, about the soil spectroscopy. Uh, we will be, our guest speaker today will be the Budiman Minister and the next speaker, the next webinar speaker will be Alex McBrenny, Professor Max, uh, Max, uh, Alex McBrenny. Uh, after that, because uh, after some communication with the countries, we realized that one of the most often asked the question is uh, how to build a global spectral library and how to use the global spectral library. So we invited uh, uh, our guest speaker uh, from Brazil and from France to give some good example from their country. And the last webinar, we will invite uh, Ayo Vendor from Israel to talk something about the measurement. But uh, please be noticed, this is just beginning of our webinar and a more webinar will be coming with different uh, languages and uh, more interesting topics. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much again for joining this uh, webinar. And now, and now it is, it, now, I now I have the great honor to give the floor to Professor Budiman Menestani from the University of Sydney, a very well-known worldwide soil scientist. He's passionate about the role of soil in managing climate, food, water, energy security, and maintaining biodiversity. You can find more information about his research interest from his webpage. My colleague Isabel will soon post his webpage in the chat box. He is also former chair of International Pedometric Working Group. He and his team was one of the first research group who started to develop some function and packages for soil spectral data analysis using R program. I remember the first time I started to use R program for thermometrics modeling was in his team. They recently published a book, Soil Spectral Inference with R Analysis Digital so, uh, analysis digital soil spectral using the R program environment, which is a very good material to learn how to use R program for soil spectral modeling. I highly recommend you to use this book for learning purposes. We are also currently collaborating with the University of Sydney to record a series of video course together with uh, the code and make it available for free on the Glossolon website by end of this year. This product is also part of our Glossolon National Capacity Development Program. In the meantime, I would also like to introduce another panelist today, Professor Alex McBrenny, Dr. Alexander Wadox, Dr. Uh, Jose Hadarin, and Dr. Edwin John. They will be, they have, they all have intensive experience in soil spectroscopy and spatial modeling. They will be here help to us today and answer some questions in the QA session. So please feel free to post your questions in the QA box anytime. Without further ado, I would like now to give the floor to Budiman, please. Let me, okay, I think you can share your screen now. Okay, thank you, uh, Isabel. Thank you, Yi Peng, for your, the introduction. All good. Can you hear me now? Okay, and thanks to Global Soil Partnership for the invitation to present uh, this webinar about the soil spectroscopy. So, uh, my name is Abudiman Minasni. I'm from the University of Sydney. Uh, with me uh, presenting this work, this work is a collective work that we do together. Uh, I'll uh, acknowledge Watini, who's not here today, but Edward Jones is in the panel. Uh, Alex McBratney is also in the panel. Jose Padarian and Alexander Wadu. So, uh, Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good day in Australia. So before I begin, uh, I'm here in Sydney. I would like to acknowledge the country where I'm presenting from. So I would like to ask, acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Euro nation, which are the land I'm standing today. 
as the traditional custodians of Australia, their long and rich history is about carrying the land and which uh, we are doing today is about soil, about the land. So before I begin, I'll just uh, clarify some per terminologies about infrared. So this is about soil spectroscopy. And what I'm talking to you today is about uh, infrared. So there are, uh, as you see, the, the, the slide here, the picture here, is in, uh, this is the electromagnetic spectrum. As you go from left to right, you have an increased wavelength, but also if you go from left to right, it's also decreasing the frequency of the electromagnetic spectrum. And within that electromagnetic spectrum, from the lowest wavelength to the highest wavelength in the middle, there is this infrared, which are very important for soil because it provides an analysis of the soil. So it starts from the visible, visible <coughs> wavelength until what we call as the mid-infrared uh, wavelength, which we will, I will talk about today. So there are different definitions, but mostly what's agree, what's agree is around 300 to 700. That's the visible, that's, no, sorry, that's the ultraviolet and then the blue and then the green and then so on and then the red. And then the 700 to 200, 2000, sorry, 700 to 2500 nanometer is what we call as the, uh, the wavelength, what we call as a, a near infrared. And then the mid infrared, what we define here in this presentation is 2500 to 25,000 nanometer. But there are different definitions, as I say, some literature. Uh, divided into near infrared, short wave infrared, and so on. But for the presentation, for this presentation, when I'm talking about near infrared, it's around 700 to 2,500. When I'm talking about mid infrared, it's 2,500 to 25,000 nanometers. So the structure of my presentation, uh, this webinar, is I'll be very general. I'll give you about what is the visible and, and IR applications. And uh, because continuing from last week, last week uh, uh, the presenter has a uh, Dr. Bostenberg uh, has presented about some of the near infrared. So I'll continue it about the near infrared applications in soil science and then how it's going to be used in the field. And then some words about how we calibrate the infrared so that it can predict uh, about the soil data. And then lastly, I will talk about mid infrared for accurate lab measurements. So let's begin. So first I'll talk about the near infrared applications in soil science. So uh, as we say before that near infrared is uh, visible to near infrared is from uh, 500 to 2500 nanometers. And the instrument, the standard instrument that people use is uh, something like this one uh, or some uh, other brands won't, won't worry about it. In this study, we've evaluated if we use the full length of the visible to, uh, visible to the full length of near infrared, that is uh, from 500 to 2,500 nanometers. So the top two, these are what we call as the, the top of the range, the, the standard, the top of the range visible to near infrared spectrum. But nowadays we have a more a low cost spectrometer that, uh, for example, this one, which uh, only, which is only part of this uh, infrared range and another infra infrared uh, spectrometer, which is only around uh, from uh, 900 to 1700. And this one is a uh, shorter, shorter interval, shorter, uh, shorter near infrared range is from around 1300 to 2450. So this is on top of it. The top one is the, 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 the state of the art, the most uh, complete spectrum of the soil. And the bottom two are the low cost infrared spectrometers because nowadays you get more and more low cost spectrometers that are available. So can we do uh, the same thing with uh, comparing the top end of the spectrometer, the first two, that is the top end of the spectrometer, the first two column is the top end of the spectrometer. And the last two are the limited range or lower cost uh, spectrometer. Right, so what you're seeing here is we are predicting different properties from soil carbon, clay content, pH, CEC of the soil, the sand content of the soil, and the exchangeable uh, calcium. 
And what we are comparing, the first two column is this, uh, the top, the, the, the standard spectrometer, visible to near infrared spectrometer. And the third column is the, the more low, low, lower cost, and the fourth column is a much lower cost uh, spectrometer, right? So, and this is related to the error, what is called the root mean square error or the error of the model. So what we can see is that the, the first two, which are the standard spectrometer, near infrared spectrometer, they will perform best, right? They will have lower error in predicting soil carbon, clay content, pH, and so on, right? But the two, the two spectrometer, which are lower cost and but a limited range, also perform as well, not, not as good as the standard spectrometer, but also can perform uh, in some cases as well as the, uh, the, the full standard spectrometer. For example, in terms of measurement of pH, they are almost uh, perform as well as the full range of spectrometer, for example, exchangeable calcium and also sand and CEC, they perform as well, right? So that means that uh, instead of using the, 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 the standard, the high of the end, the, the one that uh, is very expensive one, we can use a portable one, a small one that we can use uh, uh, and, and uh, lower cost so that we can use it uh, in the field or in the lab for estimating uh, soil properties uh, immediately. So we, we knowing that this one, the one in the middle here, the one called Neospec, is a lower cost spectrometer, we now can use it to, uh, as a tool for uh, predicting a fertilizer recommendation. So this is uh, working together with colleagues from the Indonesian in the Indonesian Center for Agricultural Development. They say they want to come up with a tool that they can give to the extension officers or uh, the, so that uh, they can go out in the field and then measure the soil and then it will give them an indication about the the fertility of the soil and for the fertilizer recommendation. So uh, the first thing that we do is that uh, we calibrate the spectrometer, the, the spectra with the soil properties that is measured in the lab. So don't worry too much about it. So I want to highlight this, the one on that is in this uh, red box is that for clay, pH, organic carbon, and uh, total nitrogen, we got a reasonable calibration. 50 to 60% of the variance can be explained by the spectrometer. And then in terms of the nutrients, what we can es estimate quite accurately is what we call as potential phosphorus or potential uh, potassium. That's all, in other words, they are total potassium or total uh, uh, phosphorus. And also the how much phosphorus that is can be uh, re retained, uh, absorbed by the soil, P retention, exchangeable calcium, exchangeable magnesium, CEC, and uh, best base saturation. But the one that cannot be estimated accurately is available P or available K, available phosphorus or available potassium. We'll come back to it again uh, later on, but, but uh, having to know the basic soil properties, having to know the properties of the soil that is related to how much it can absorb nutrients, how much of its the capacity, the CEC, how much is potential available. We can develop a tool that give uh, the, uh, the, a tool to the extension officer that if uh, this is the soil, this is the spectra, and then it will give you an estimate of the uh, predictions of the soil properties. And using uh, this kind of uh, tools in in a, in a, in a, in a mobile phone or a smartphone app, then you can do a fertilizer recommendation because over uh, in uh, the Indonesian Center for Agriculture, they already have lots of trials, fertilizer trials that uh, fits this how much uh, fertilizer and uh, it's added and how much is the yield. So they have this uh, mis uh, this relationship already as established that gives them an idea that given this uh, information, we can use this uh, infrared uh, technology to estimate the fertilizer recommendation. This is uh, for, for farmer application. So this is one uh, application that we, uh, that we work together with the Indonesian Center for Agriculture so that uh, the tool is not just for uh, our uh, 
uh, research, but how, how we can translate the, from the research to uh, application. And the next I'll talk about the near infrared for soil inference, because as you can see that the infrared spectrum of the soil, although you can see that it's a spectrum, but it is sort of interpretable because it contains information about the, the minerals of the soil, about the, the character of the minerals of the soil, about how much clay is in the soil. What we can do for research and for pedology purpose is that we can take this infrared and then go out in the field and measure it directly. So this work is uh, by at, at Jones, what we call is proximal sensing in soil profiles. So if we have a soil profiles, we go out and take a spectrometer and then we scan it and then it can give us an idea directly in the field about how much is the organic carbon distribution and how much clay is uh, distributed in the soil. In this example, this is in Australia, what we call as a duplex soil, a uh, texture contrast soil. You can see that uh, on, the, on, the, on the surface soil, up to 40 centimeter, it's a sandy, but it hits this layer where it has a clay soil. So infrared can give us directly in the field. So the, the actual amount of clay and the actual, not the actual amount, the, the estimate of the, clay and the estimate of the carbon in the soil. But we can go further, not just a basic properties, not just texture, not just pH, not just a CEC, but we can go further what we call as a spectral inference system. That means that we have relationship that we, we, we know about if this is the texture, if this is the CEC, then how much we can expect it, the field capacity would be, and so on. So doing that, we can also, uh, estimate the mineral composition that uh, about what is the makeup of this soil because uh, as we showed earlier that the infrared contains information about the mineral composition of the soil. So for example, in this, in this location, in this soil, most of the topsoil is sandy material, so it's uh, mostly quartz. And the clay that it has is a kaolin, kaolinite clay so as you go down the profile, as it's uh, increased the clay, then you get a proportion, how much is it due to quartz, how much is it due to kaolinite and other minerals as well. In this example, the soil here on the B horizon has a, a, a calcium carbonate. We can estimate that uh, how much cal calcium carbonate it is and the different types of clay that is, this is uh, not a pure kaolinite because it has a mixture with elite and and so on, uh, spec type. And the last one, this is a vertisol, and then we can estimate that this, the main mineral of this soil is a spec type and so on. So using this uh, infrared technology uh, in the field, we can be more certain, we can get more information about the composition of the soil and about the, about the mineral of the soils. And finally, we can also estimate how about the quality of the soil Given this kind of texture, given this kind of mineral, what would be a, the expected amount of solids, amount of water that are available, amount of water that are not available. And uh, this is an estimate about the available water capacity of uh, the soil. This is all based on the inference from the, uh, which uh, our colleague will talk about next week, about the inference, about how much uh, water is in the soil given this this uh, this this info this uh, texture and so on. So as a summary, for example, if we want to use this soil as a function to grow crops, uh, we can say that what is what can we learn from this soil? Uh, site A, the top soil is sandy, it's a low available water capacity, it's low CEC, and um, but the the B, B horizon sixty to one hundred centimeter is a heavy clay but the heavy clay is kaolinite, it's not expensive, it's infertile, therefore it's uh, not, not suitable for cropping potential, but site B, it has moderate available water capacity, has high uh, calcium carbonate, uh, the pH is uh, neutral to high, and so it's quite fertile, and the site C is clay, it has a, a expensive clay, it is a spec type clay, it's a moderate amount of calcium carbonate, high available water capacity. That is uh, using this kind of information, we can build a complete picture about the soil. 
So this is the second example. And the third example is, uh, can we use this in the field, but not just uh, over here, we say that we, we dig a profile or take a soil core and then we scan it. But uh, what we say is that can we go out in the field and then if we embed the penetrom embed the infrared in the penetrometer and we push it on the ground, in the ground, in the soil, can we get a direct measurement? And in this case that uh, in Australian condition that we want to estimate soil carbon because uh, soil carbon is tradable in Australia. Uh, here, we can give an example for different uh, soils that uh, with a penetrometer, it goes, it push it in on the soil and then it collects the spectra every centimeter and then each centimeter it predicts the uh, carbon content of the soil. So we get a complete picture about the distribution of the organic carbon in the soil using this, uh, this instrument. So this is, this is just an example. These are just examples of uh, what we can take the near infrared spectrometer that is from the research base to, to the field doing an application that is either for farmers or either for research or more for uh, uh, general analysis. So that's about near infrared. And now I'll talk more about uh, mid infrared for lab soil analysis. So the difference is that, as we say before, that uh, near infrared is uh, from 700 to 2,500 nanometers. And then for, uh, for, for mid infrared, it's, it's the other way, it's, it should be from this way, from 2,500 to 25,000 nanometers, but it's usually expressed in terms of the frequency one over centimeter or the inverse of the, of the wavelength. So we won't worry about that too much. But what we can visually, we can, we can visually see that although these are different soils, that the, 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 the curve of the spectra for the, for the near infrared is very smooth. And the peak of that, uh, each of this uh, individual peak of this identified peak is very broad and very diffuse, right? But for mid infrared, what it's called, it's a, it's a fundamental molecular vibrations with well-defined peaks that Within this peak, within this area, we can say that this is due to kaolinite. This is quite, quite pro pro prominent, quite pronounced that this is the peak for kaolinite. And there are some peaks that's related to organic matter. So this peak is related to quartz. This peak is related to, to smectite. It is quite, uh, because it's a fundamental vibration, mid-infrared provides uh, a well-defined peaks that are uh, so that it can provide more information about the soil solid. But the difference is that the near infrared is robust for field use. That means if you take it in the field and then you measure the infrared, the spectra will be clean. It's not going to be affected too much. Sorry, I mean that the spectra is not going to be distorted. Uh, the spectra is not going to be noisy because it's uh, the soil in the field is not smooth. So you haven't ground it then. It, it can um, record the spectra because of the, of the shorter wavelength. And it's suitable for field analysis, but the mid-infrared, although it contains more information, it can then the molecular vibrations, fundamental peaks, but it's not robust to, for field use because it's quite sensitive to the uh, environment, uh, about the surface roughness of the soil and so on. So it's not, uh, well suited in the field, right? So that's why we're saying that mid-infrared spectroscopy is suitable for lab analysis, that if you take your samples back in the lab and then uh, grind it and then homogenize it, and then you use the mid-infrared mid spectroscopy or spectrometer, you will get good results, which I will show you or I will share with you later on, right? So this is just an example of the mid-infrared spectrum where I say that it's very clear is that if you look at this peak here around 3700, this is quite, quite prominent for kaolinite that you get this peak that is as a triple, it looks like the crown of a king, the triple, triple is a, it's, once you see that in the spectrum, you know that this is kaolinite. And then elite, you can see that this, the shape is, a, is completely different from the kaolinite and for the monomorial nut or smectite, you can see the shape is uh, quite different. So they are fundamental, 
fundamental vibration, fundamental characteristic, then you can see, you can visualize, except that you can visualize on your spectra, right? So because of these fundamental uh, peaks, then people have been uh, questioning, have been uh, asking the question, this is already 23 years ago in 1998, Lesiani and colleagues uh, in, uh, in South Australia, they asked, can mid-infrared diffuse reflectant analysis replace salt extraction? That means if I take my samples in the lab and do the mid-infrared diffuse reflectance analysis, can I get the same results as if you take your samples and, and do the lab analysis? And we're going to answer that. So this has been asked 23 years ago. This has been researched 23 years ago, but the take up <coughs> is still quite slow because I think first it's about the, the instrument, about the which type of instrument, about the, the instrument is still, still not widely used. It's still expensive. And the second is the, 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 the analysis of the, the spectra, which now I think is not going to be a problem because now you have a free software and which, the, which there will be a cost later the year that will be given that you taking this spectra, you can now do analysis that, are, that will be quite difficult 23 years ago, where 23 years ago, you need to use special software and so on. So before, before we begin about the, the soil, which uh, soil properties can be used and which, uh, which, which can be uh, can be predicted. First, I'll talk about calibration and accuracy. So this is uh, one, one thing that Yi from FAO asked me that, can you talk a little bit about calibration and accuracy? Because there could be some misunderstanding. So what we have is the spectra and what we want is soil properties. So the spectra looks something like this, although there are fundamental peaks that tell you that this is a clay mineral, this, that this is due to the uh, alkyl of the organic matter. So this is a uh, organic soils, and then there are some quartz and so on. But these are not, uh, you cannot use that peak directly like uh, in chemistry, right? So if you measure this, this height of this peak or the area of this peak, it doesn't going, it's not going to give you organic matter because it's a, a, a carbon content of the soil because the spectra of a soil uh, because soil, it contains a lot of different minerals and, uh, and organic materials and they interact, interact uh, with each other. So that uh, it's, it's not straightforward to interpret the, the peaks of the spectra. So we need to have some calibration that given this spectra, uh, the calibration will calculate and then give you the properties. So for example, what is the texture? What is the pH? What is the CEC and so on? To do that, we need to do have this calibration function. So how does the calibration functions, right? So the, the calibration functions, if it's a simple system, for example, a concentration of a nutrient in water, because there's no other, there's no other information, there's no other uh, elements in the pure, pure water, then you can do a univariate calibration. That means the height of the peak will tell you something about the concentration. But because the soil is a mixture of many other things, many different things, those peaks doesn't work. Why? Because it's a, it's a combination, even if it's a mixture of organic matter and, uh, diff uh, and clay, it will have interaction, interaction between the elements. The soil has uh, lots of elements, uh, which we'll see about. It's not going to give you a, a pure response or a pure... Uh, smooth. So we need to use the whole spectra, but what we can do, we need to, to use the whole spectra and use a calibration model to that will tell us that if this is the spectra, this would be the clay content and so on. So which is called a multivariate calibration. That it's a multivariate, it's not just one peak or single peak, but the whole spectra. And the whole spectra, it's a, people call it ultra spectral, or why ultra spectral? Because the whole spectra is about two thousand variables, right? So in a in in a on a drone or on a plane, people call about hyperspectral. Hyperspectral image. Hyperspectral image contains around hundreds of bands, and uh, multispectral in a landsat the satellite images contain multispectral image 
because it contain multiple bands, four bands, five bands, or 11 bands, or 20 bands, but hyperspectral contains hundreds of bands. But in the lab analysis, lab NIR, lab MIR, we got uh, ultraspectral, we got thousands of wavelengths, right? Which are difficult to, to handle if you're using a standard linear regression models because you can use a linear regression models, then, then uh, it's just a matter of what's your solve. Uh, variables your interest and this uh, this spectra you multiply by regression coefficients then you get some kind of calibration functions but this kind of model doesn't work because the spectra as I said you got thousands of variables sometimes you got more predictor variables than the more than the samples for example you can get 2,000 spectra values and you only have 100 soil samples so the linear regression uh, breaks down. And in addition that the spectra are highly, highly correlated, that means between one band to the other band, if I'm here and I'm here, they are correlated. That means that the really the, the conventional uh, linear relationship breaks down, it doesn't work. So we need to do some kind of treatment to the spectra. One solution, some of the solution is called uh, variable selection, some of it reduction, dimension reduction. And the one thing that people mostly use is the principal component analysis. You might have heard about it. That means that this spectra, if we multiply by some transformation matrix, it will give you a scores. That means that this, this spectra is now become variables that are reduced in dimensions, but then they are not correlated and can be used indirectly in a modeling. So this is one way, but there are different ways that uh, we don't, I can't explain everything to you, but I'll show you some examples of the results. And one of the, one of the standard way that people call is partial least square regression. We won't go too much about it, but it's just taking the spectra and then it uh, does some transformation about the spectra and give you the prediction, right? So once it gives you a prediction, you need to know about how accurate it is, how accurate this uh, prediction it is. And that's why we need to do some accuracy measurements. We need to plot what is the measured value versus the predicted values. We need to measure some kind of statistics. One statistics that's in, in the literature is called a root mean square error. That means how much error are we expecting. In the near infrared literature, it's called standard error of prediction, uh, which maybe in statistics is it's kind of misleading, but. That's what people call it in, in a near infrared literature. Uh, it's called SEP, standard error of prediction. Don't ask me why, but that's it. And the other one is about the mean error or bias, about how much bias is the prediction. So this is just an example. This two is the measure. This is the predicted. Uh, this is one to one line. So this is the R square is uh, 0.832. I'll talk more about the R square. But there's no bias because uh, it's uh, almost, uh, if you plot one to one line, they are fall, fall mostly around the mean. But this one, there's some bias. That means that all the prediction, all the measured values are predicted higher than what it should be. It has some bias on it. So this is what we call as a bias. And again, if you see that the R square, maintains the same. That means that the linear relation, there is a linear relationship and the linear relationship explain 83% of the variance, but there is a bias. That means that uh, uh, we need to take account of this bias in the prediction. While the root mean square error tells us about the spread, the spread of the, the, the error. So this is measured value, predicted values. So if we assume that it's normally distributed, then around four times of the standard error or root mean four times the root mean square error will be two times standard deviation plus or minus. This will be the, the spread of your, of your error, which we'll, we'll talk about it later, right? So don't worry too much. This is not about statistic. And then R square, I'm sure you've heard about R square. That is how much uh, or the coefficient of determination that is how much variance is explained by the model. Right, so there's other prediction quality that people say that because uh, the R square, if you compare these two, 
uh, it will give you the same R square, but one is biased. Uh, it's not going to the, the R square is giving a, not a true indication. Then people call, call it a concordant correlation coefficient, which measures the degree of the correlation within a one-to-one -one line. So this is just an example that the Pearson correlation is 85%. And 85%, but the concordance, this one is 81, and this one is 62, because this one has a slight bias uh, towards it. So uh, we won't talk too much about it, but the one thing that uh, that is uh, that he asked me to tell to, to, to make a, to a point to you that uh, that we, when you read a literature, when you read a paper, if you just rely on R square. You're going to you can get a you can get deceived or you can get a, a not true relationship. You need to see the relationship, and this is just an example that uh, that uh, a famous statistician wrote that these four relationship or data set they all have the same mean, the same variance, and the same correlation. That's all the R square is 0.67, but obviously. You can only trust the first one, but not the the, the other the other three, right? So uh, so the don't just trust the R square value when you read the literature when you read the paper that says the R square is such and such. Uh, first, look at the plot, look at the relationship before you before before you make a, a conclusion, right? And R square because R square the, the the formula is that it's it's one minus the residual over the variance of the data. So if you want to increase the the R square, what you can do is that you can just increase the variance of the data. That means that you'll you'll have a better R square. This is just an example. If this is a random value, you'll see the R square is just a 0.3. There's no relationship, right? There's no relationship. But if there are two highly uh, leverage point, highly, this is the same data set, this is the same data here, zero to three. But if you include some two high values here, you suddenly get a very high R square, which is meaningless. So the, the, what you need to do is that beside the R square values, Beside the concordance value, we need to look at the relationship. We need to look at the error. So if you see that the error, this is 0.74. The error, this is 1.6, right? So the error uh, R square is, is just one of the measures that uh, you have to be careful about. So that's, that's the message. So, and now we're going to look at uh, the mid infrared. Uh, how can we use? How accurate is this mid infrared for measuring soil properties? So I'm going to go through a few soil properties, an extensive list of soil properties, and uh, we can discuss about it. So as we said before, to, to make a prediction, we need a spectra, but also we need a standard lab measurement, right? We need the spectra and also lab standard measurement to do this calibration functions. And fortunately, uh, our colleague in the USDA uh, Soil Survey Laboratory, so they have an archive of more than 17,000 17, soil profiles from the US with well-documented and precise standard operating procedures, a lot of soil analysis. So they have the mid-infrared spectrum, they have the mid-infrared uh, spectra of each of those soil profiles, and then each of the accompanying it is the soil analysis, soil uh, a standard lab analysis. So with this uh, uniform, we, with this uh, uniform techniques in the laboratory and spectra, we can uh, know now, uh, we can be assured that uh, what we're getting is not due to the random chance or due to uh, and so on. So to do that, we use a, a method called a, a memory-based learning or it's a local PLS method, don't worry about it, it's just a, a method. So we take this, the soil sample, the whole 17,000, so it's more than, it's around 50,000 soil samples. And then we divide it 75 as a calibration, 25 as a validation. That means that 
75% is going to be used to build a model and 25% is not going to be uh, using the model. So, um, so that we don't have a chance that we get, we pick a good one or pick a bad one. We repeated this uh, procedure 10 times so that we can get a clear understanding of what it is, right? So the first techniques also that we, we try is uh, this called uh, deep learning. It's called a convolutional neural network. So it's a new technique that take spectra and then sort of do a scanning and then uh, fit it into a neural network and then predict the functions. And CNN is mostly used in, a, in a image analysis. It's just like how Facebook recognize your friend. So what we are asking is how can uh, that, that algorithm, uh, given the spectra, how can it recognize our soil? So it turns out it, it performs quite well. So in terms of total carbon, organic carbon, CEC, clay, sand, and pH. So this is around, uh, kind of, so this is calibrated around 30 something, 40,000 soil samples and it's validated around uh, one 10,000 soil samples, right? So this is, a, this is quite a complete data set and what is, uh, it contains a different a range of uh, total carbon from zero to 10%, organic carbon the same, CEC from a low to a high CEC and uh, from clay from zero to, to 80 plus percent and pH uh, from around three to around uh, nine. So it contains a huge uh, range of values uh, because it was collected for the whole of US contains a range of soil. And what we can see that we can get an R square, although I say that be careful when you use the R square, but if you look at the plot on the right one, the, the right head corner one, the one that is called the, deep, the CNN, the deep learning one, we can get an R square of 0 0.95, 0 0.96, 0 0.97, 0 0.98. That means using a standard method of a mid infrared and with uh, calibrated against standard uh, standard measurement, we can get a very accurate measurements of a, a total carbon, organic carbon, and the difference in organic carbon, CEC, clay, sand, silt, and pH directly. So that is a a, a big plus, right? So that's the basic properties that we are, we know that the, the spectra is responding to, but there are also different other properties that can be, that, that have been measured. And then we ask, can it be predicted? So uh, again, the US uh, laboratory, they have about 200 soil physical, chemical and biological properties. So we run some simulate, uh, uh, modeling and then we want to figure out which one is um, which well predicted and which one is not well predicted. To do that, we group it into four categories of assessment, A, B, C, D. So this is just for the, uh, uh, so that we can understand it later. A, that means that the performance, the R square is very high. It got very low bias. It, uh, it has high concordance and so on. So A and B, uh, the second rating is B. It also get a very high R square. And the C is a moderate R square. The mean R square is around 0.67 or 0.7. And then the D one is the, the R square is uh, lower around 0.4, right? So we say A, B, C, D. So A, B is a high quality performance. C is the medium quality and D is a low performance, right? So just remember A, B, C, D and we'll go through it. So for soil chemical properties, before we begin, we have a hypothesis that we say that properties, because infrared, what you're doing is uh, uh, getting the soil and you have infrared uh, signature uh, characterized to it because it has uh, to do with the mineral components, with to do with the soil surface chemistry of the soil. It will be well predicted, but properties that are related to soil solution or soil extraction chemistry should not be well predicted. Why? Because it's a characteristic, even for the available P, uh, for example, uh, Bray P, Olson P, or other types of extraction, you still don't have a good correlation. That means that the, 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 the soil, it's, it's not related to the soil surface because the, the infrared is only looking at the surface chemistry, right? And then elements in a higher concentration and related to the soil minerals should be well predicted. So this is our first, this is our 
hypothesis. And first we look at the, what is called the Meili extraction, which is a, a, a mild acid that people use that with this extraction, you can analyze a lot of elements. And what we found is that elements that such as calcium, aluminum, and magnesium and barium, because it is responding to the chemical element of the soil, mineral element and the soil, and it is in a higher concentration, it's in high concentration, it is well predicted. So what you see is A and group A and B, while the others like silicon, potassium, silicon, uh, and potassium is not well predicted. What we see is a D, and but like a iron, sodium, manganese, manganese, strontium is only mildly predicted. So in other words, it's mostly related to the range of the data. So that means if it's in high concentration, such as this one, the calcium, aluminum, magnesium, and barium, you can get well prediction because uh, its concentration is high enough and also it's related to the mineral content of the cell. So uh, mainly extraction uh, is an extractor of the, of the soil. It's only related to the high, the one that is uh, with a high concentration. And for phosphorus, people want to know what's the available phosphorus. Unfortunately, available phosphorus such as water-soluble phosphorus, brady extractable phosphorus, Olson's extractable phosphorus, mainly extractable phosphorus, cannot be predicted well because it's related to the soil solution, right? the extraction of the soil solution. But what can be predicted very well is the phosphorus retention or phosphorus retention capacity. That means that uh, the measure of how much phosphorus that can be uh, sorbed or retained by the soil, absorbed or retained by the soil, which is uh, very useful in some tropical soils uh, and with the high uh, iron and aluminum oxides. Uh, this, is a, this is an expensive measure, but mid-infrared can predict it very well. Right? So phosphorus absorption, yes, but phosphorus in the solution, no. And then we look at the elemental concentration or the total concentration, total element concentration of the soil. And what we can see that it's quite amazing that the mid-infrared can, can characterize most of the abundant, uh, most of the in abundant uh, mineral of the soil, like uh, something that is abundant is to do with aluminum, potassium, sodium, silicon, uh, vanadium, uh, beryllium, which is uh, it's a minor trace elements, but it's related to the mineral. This is the major uh, element, potassium, aluminum, silicon. So this is the total concentration of the soil, well predicted, but also magnesium, uh, iron. So the, the one that is colored the red and the green, they are all very well predicted. And some of the one that is that are not well predicted are the one that has a, a low concentration, such as antimony or tungsten, which is low concentration, that's very tiny amount and is probably not related and except that it's, it's probably related to, to contamination and so on. But uh, we can see that a huge amount of major element, a huge amount of macronutrients, total macronutrients can be predicted reasonably well. And some of the heavy metals like nickel, copper, lead, cobalt, and tin, even though this, these are not contaminated soils, these are natural agricultural soils, mostly agricultural soils and natural soils, they can be well predicted. And we, we look at silica, for example, this is silica. If we look at the prediction using mid infrared and we predict, we compare it if we just use the basic soil properties that we know is related to silica, the clay, sand, CC, the pH of the organic matter, we can see that we get much better information from the mid-infrared because the mid-infrared also contains information about the, the mineral of the soil, while this one uh, is a sort of indirect prediction. So mid-infrared itself is a, uh, it's a, it's a good predictor in silica. Uh, some uh, Now there's an interest because it's uh, found that in some some plants, especially rice, this is a, a, a 
very important. Macronutrients. But in terms of, uh, again, in terms of extraction, this is in terms of saturation extract, electrical conductivity, and all the elements that are in the saturation extract. We can't predict it because it's, a more, it's, it's to do with the extraction method. So it's, a, it's something that a, the mid infrared cannot predict. And organic matter, different types of organic matter, total carbon, organic carbon, inorganic carbon, and carbon, labile carbon uh, due to a potassium permanganate extract. We can predict it very, very accurately. The R square is 0 0.92 to 0 0.97. Total nitrogen, reasonably well. The particulate organic matter, which I'll explain later, is also predicted well. And gluco, the beta glu glucosidase is an enzyme activity in the soil. We can also predict it reasonably well. But the thing that we, we found uh, that is uh, not well predicted is, uh, is still sulfur. We still don't know why uh, we, we can't predict well the, the sulfur. And nowadays, uh, it's not just about total carbon, it's, but the, sorry, it's not just about the organic carbon, but different forms, format, forms of organic matter. So people have to differentiate it. There's a particular organic matter that means that uh, small organic fragments that has been decomposed less than two millimeters, but it's still not incorporated in the mineral of the soil. This is called particulate organic matter. And the lifetime is shorter because uh, it's not protected. It can be uh, uh, consumed by microbes and so on. And then there's the mineral associated organic matter that is organic matter that is uh, complex by the mineral. And then there's a resistant organic carbon such as char or other organic carbon that is uh, that has become resistant due to, to, to the process. Uh, now people have uh, sort of tried to differentiate it into particular organic matter, mineral associated organic matter, resistant organic matter. Now we can have uh, evidence that we can use it as well using uh, mid-infrared. This kind of uh, not just the total carbon, but it's not just a total organic carbon, but also the different types of carbon, the particular or the mineral associated and the resistant organic carbon can be well predicted. And uh, finally, we'll talk about soil physical properties. So the proposition again is that properties based on soil, solid composition and surfaces can be, should be well predicted. But if it's pore space relationship, it shouldn't be well predicted. Uh, we'll talk about it later. And People want to know, well, can it predict bulk density or not? And the answer is maybe an indication, but we have to realize about what is mid-infrared actually measured. So this is a film. This is going to affect the bulk density, right? About the aggregation. And in the mid-infrared lab analysis, you take those soil and you crush it and you make it into this pellet and scan it. Does it make sense that it it can predict uh, bulk density or aggregate stability. Probably not, but what it can give is an indication of that given this type of mineral, different this sort of uh, uh, um, clay and different uh, mineral, this is, would be the likely bulk density. So the R, although the R square is 0 0.71, but we can say the error is a uh, 0.11, that means four times of this, that uh, you're probably looking at an error about uh, 0.4 or 0.5 of a unit of a bulk density. So if you just want to use it for a rough estimate that this is the given, the, the given soil, what would be the approximate bulk density, probably you can uh, uh, use it or estimate the, the bulk density. And also aggregate uh, stability in this measure is not that well predicted. I think it's uh, it's to do with the because it's to do with the aggregation. And the people what want to know is uh, can it measures field capacity? Can it measures uh, water retention? Can it measures available water capacity? It depends, right? So we have to know a little bit about soil physics. So when we measure field capacity, what we say is sorry. 
what we say is that this is to do with clot when we want to measure water retention that is uh, un, uh, that is a uh, uh, wetter than wetter than one third bar or 33 uh, kilopascal or pf2 pf2.5 in in some measurements is that we need to use clot because because these are water that are available in between the aggregates right if you use uh, if you use crush samples or sieve samples you'll get different results and you you can see in this lab result we have clot data data that are measured with clot and data that are based on sieve and dry samples right so if this is sieve and dry samples that is looks similar like this we can have a high accuracy in in measuring the water retention at 0.06 bar or six centimeters or sorry yeah six centimeters this is 100 centimeters no, sorry 60 centimeter 100 centimeter 300 centimeter people call it a one third bar the field capacity in the us is very accurately but this is remember this is a sieve samples right sieve samples but if it's a clock samples that looks like this and you crush it and you measure it, the accuracy is uh, relatively low. That means that uh, it's a it's a sea level accuracy at the sea level. Similarly, if it's water retention at a wilting point, which uh, the the clock doesn't, you you can use a sieve sample. You can measure it very accurately, right? So, uh, depend what is what what is your purpose, right? So again, this is an example of field capacity reasonably r square but if you like look at the the error so the error is around nine percent if you look at the field capacity the the relationship is tighter the error is around four percent so depend how much error you want to uh, if it's just a if it's just a pedal transfer functions that you are asking you can probably use that so in 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 other words, one scan, this is all come from one scan, one scan, one, one sample, you take the mid infrared and it can give you all these properties, microbial biomass, particulate organic matter, and so on, pH and so on. So one, one spectrum, you can get a lot of different properties that are well estimated. And what we, we calculate, that's about 50 soil properties that are well estimated and there are 50 properties that are reasonably well as reasonably estimated right so that's a good thing that means that you can once one spectrum you can do a lot of assessment for example uh, for crop production or soil fertility knowing the texture minerals and calcium carbonate a ph will give you about the condition about the soil and about the soil carbon or ph that uh, that what's the effect of management what we can't do well is that we can only give you an estimate about the bulk density and plant available water. But what the what the MIR cannot do well is give you the, the effect of management, but it can give you an indication about the, the physical condition and the ideal conditions. But still, uh, looking at if you want to assess it for soil production or fertility, about nutrient cycling, carbon storage, and so on. All these properties that are estimated from the from the single spectrum of the inf mid infrared can give you a lot of information. So uh, that's about it. So in summary, mid or mid infrared offers a rapid and highly accurate measurements of many physical uh, chemical properties. So we counted as about fifty properties that are well estimated, and fifty other fifty properties that are reasonably well estimated or mediumly estimated, right? So it's related to the soil mineral components, surface chemistry. It is the, it's, it's well estimated. If it's related to the extraction chemistry, available, available nutrients, we still, we, there's no reason why it can be predicted well, right? Uh, you can see it as an as a alternative to uh, uh, pedal transfer functions. And uh, about, the, about the detail, about how you process from the spectra into properties, uh, this is in the book, a bit of promotion, of course, 
but uh, the uh, there will be a course later, training course offered by uh, that will be available at the FAO website very soon. And this is some acknowledgement to my colleagues in Indonesia and in in the uh, US for the for the collaboration. And thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much, uh, Woody. Many thanks for this a great presentation. Give us a very comprehensive review about using the soil spectroscopy to measure the different soil properties. And uh, we have uh, we had uh, quite a lot of questions and answered uh, by colleagues from your team, and totally more than fifty questions already. And uh, we, we we also saw some interesting questions. Would like to invite you answer it live. Uh, the so first is done on. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, the first question uh, is the soil profile in many, many slides show a high resolution in terms of the depth point on the order or few millimeter. If I'm not wrong, how these readings were obtained in suit or at the lab after collecting samples from the field? Okay, so I think uh, it, it's it's not every, so it's I, not every millimeters. I uh, put the question in the chat box so you can read it again for sure. Okay, yeah, okay, thank you. So I think it's it's I think maybe maybe it looks too high resolution, but it's not it's not every centimeter. So mm -hmm. the one that's on the profile, I think it's every five centimeters that are uh, that we do it in the profile, but now. Um, Using the penetrometer, uh, which my my colleagues have done, it's a you can do it a continuous measurement. So it's taking measurement every one centimeter. Okay. Okay, so manually, manual for if it's manually, uh, yeah, it's very tiring to scan every centimeter. But uh, now with the with the with the penetrometer, automatic collection of penetrometer, so we can get measurements of uh, every uh, centimeter of. Uh, of the spectrum. Yeah, thank you. The uh, second question I just posted in the chat box, would it be possible to estimate the concentration of the soluble component in the extracting solution? Yes, I think, I think yeah, I think that's one, one possibility. So, because it's, it's uh, if, if you can measure, so if you can measure, if you can measure the concentrations of the solution, the extracted extracted solutions as well, I think uh, that can, can be uh, that that can be an option as well. Uh, uh, using uh, different different uh, different kind of uh, uh, but that's a different kind of spectrometer because that's uh, to do with the liquid liquid uh, tr the transmittance of the of the. Uh, I think this is the last question, and uh, we found it's quite interesting, can be very interesting for many audience. It's about the estimating soil fungi. No, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> why, why, why should it be? I mean, I think it's, uh, yeah, many, yeah. I think it should be, I think, uh, yeah, it is to do with the biology, what, what, what biology signal because the biological signal of the uh, of, of bacteria or the the, the or, or fungi or other other the other eye organism I don't think that the, the spectra can can separate out. Okay, I think that there are some new questions coming from. Uh... QA box, would you please feel free mm. if uh, any of them you, you feel good to answer? Yeah, so one of the slides, I think, one of the slides I said, I said that these are the qualities, but mycorrhiza is the one that cannot, cannot be well, cannot be uh, estimated. But, yeah. So there's a uh, Microbial biomass. I think microbial biomass. Either they have different studies already that uh, show that it, it can be estimated 
especially the the the, the the total biomass, the total microbial biomass, the PLFA. I think there, there is a paper that already showed that it is reasonably well estimated. Uh, and then the and then uh, is RPD a good option? Uh, there's no there's no one there's no one measurement because RPD is exactly the same as R square. So there's no one measurement that uh, I think the, the is that don't just trust one one single index, but uh, look at look at look at uh, the the different the the whole, about the error about the about the distribution and so on. Uh, could we get a state irrespective? about the instruments i think the instrument doesn't it's it's not affecting too much i think if you're using one instrument that it should be well but converting from one instrument to the other that's another that's another issue because of each instrument it could produce a, a different different uh, spectral signal but there are ways of uh, trying to trying to handle that so uh, can we say MIR has all the information which is included in the visual NIR. I would say yes, most most probably ex except for the for the color which are which the M mid infrared does not uh, measure. How does the number of points affect the test for accuracy? Yes, of course. You've got more points, more data, you'll get more uh, more representation and more accuracy. So how, how do we define a good prediction model? So I don't think there's a one universal, one universal, uh, some people like to say, oh, if the R square is greater than 0.6 or 0.7, then you get a, a good model, but it depends. I think it depends on the context as well. I think we shouldn't try to say that if it's the R square or RPD greater than this, then it's, it's, it's excellent or it's good. If it's less than this, is it depends on uh, uh, the error, how how and the uncertainty and what what uh, what is your application. Uh, it's rapid, but much time to spend in processing the data. Will this potentially negate this? Uh, I think. Uh, So the, the mid infrared, I think in, 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 in the lab, uh, I think one of the limitation is uh, that we haven't, we didn't talk about is that the infrared is, uh, it, it needs to be uh, uh, in the lab, in, in the dry condition, in the, in the standard condition, and it, it will, will perform better if it's uh, also a grind in the finer, finer, finer soil. Uh, yeah, that could be a trade-off because it, the processing, the but I don't think the the data analysis nowadays. I don't think it's a it's a limitation because nowadays you can uh, program it and it's it could be uh, available. So any any spectra, it's it, it shouldn't be a problem. Uh, I think the oh, there is a one, oh, there is a continuous question, Tom Young. <laughs> <laughs> So what is the preferred method of data calibrating? And I think that one, Alexander is uh, responding by the text. Yeah. Uh, okay. We can go next maybe. Okay. Do you think MIR is going to replace this MIR future proximal sensing tool? I think it, 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 I think the MIR is still has problems to use in the field. I think uh, it's, it's still affected too much of the they are portable mid infrared, but I think it's it's still uh, it's it's for soil is still challenging. Yeah, so there are values of uh, using in uh, this MIR in the field, and there are values of using mid infrared in the lab. Do you need to build a regional calibration? Uh, it depends on your application. So if you think that uh, you want to use it as a as a lab that you take sample from the whole region i think it, it will be it will be a good idea yeah but uh, a lot of places a lot of uh, even a lot of commercial labs 
when they analyze the soil samples, they, they don't throw away the samples. They keep it at least one month, right? Because of uh, for, for, for checking or for other issues, I think. If you're working with the if you're working with a commercial lab, I think that's a that's a good resource that you can tap into them. That uh, if you can ask them to to give them the, the soil samples, they already analyze that people already pay for. Then then you can build a, a, a library. Okay, I guess this will be the last one. The last one about uh, ESP and EC. Uh, yeah, I think, yeah, I'm not sure. I think, I think most of the, most of the data that we look at, it's, it's not, it's not well, but maybe because of ESP, they are, because it changed some of the properties. And if in case of an extreme, I think it could be in some cases, it could be, so it's, it's not universal, but in some cases, I think there, there are cases where I see that ESP and EC uh, are predicted. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you, Buddy. And in the last, I just want to add because from the chat box, and many colleagues asked about the this book, and I would like to say I would like to mention one more time is this book uh, is not uh, completely open access. So if you can find a way to borrow this book from your library or uh, your university or your lab, we can. Can, can pay for this book. We would encourage you to use this book. Otherwise, we are currently working together with the University of Sydney and the, uh, and the, the, uh, the big team uh, with uh, Budiman and uh, Alex. And we are currently recording some video course based on this book. And so give a training uh, for the spectral modeling using our program. And this video course will be online in our Close long world page by end of this year. So everybody will benefit this video course and repeatedly repeatedly watch this video course and then learn how to use our program for the spectral modeling. So a very big thanks, thank you to our today presenter. And the, the today I think we reached almost 400 participants who joined the second webinar on soil spectroscopy. My colleague is now posting the link to the other four webinars scheduled on soil spectroscopy and you all invited to join and register. Remember to check this page regularly as another series of webinar on wet chemistry, health and safety equipment purchase, quality assurance and quality control and the laboratory management will be organized in next few months. And the certificate will be issued and it will be sent by email automatically after two, two weeks after the webinar. So please be patient. Dear, uh, or, uh, dear participants, the recording of the webinar will be shared with you or together with a small report and the presentation of our speaker of the day. Thank you all once again, and I wish you all a pleasant end of the day or evening. Thank you, Woody. Thank you, everyone. And all the panelists are helping with the questions. Thanks. Thanks, yeah. too. Thank you. Bye.